Praise the Lord. God is good. How many are blessed to be in the house of God? I mean, how many are really blessed to be in the house of God? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many know that God has called us to put our hands to the plow and to serve them out here? Amen. Because you know, one, one, one day or another, or if something happens, you're going to be serving God somewhere. Praise the Lord. Rest assured. If you're a child of the living God, God is going to get a hold of you. And God is going to have his way. Praise the Lord. I know it sounds like we got a little bit of a rebuke coming in, but it's love. Amen. It's, and like my wife said, it, it, it's concern for the body of Christ. I mean, it's God. The Bible says that the Lord chastises those that he loves. Amen. Some of the hardest things if we are real is when we go through crisis and, and hard situations where where we learn is when we come to our senses, um, the Bible says that we come back to the Father, amen, and where God restores and, and releases us to be all we can be. But uh, I'm thankful to be here. I, I thank God for my salvation uh, every day, daily. Like Paul says, I subject my body unto, uh, I beat it down daily. Because this flesh is no good. Apart from God, there's nothing good. Maybe in you. But the Bible says that there's nothing good in me apart from Jesus. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for their tithe and for their giving and, and for their hands to the plow in, in the house of God. And uh, God is so good. He's so faithful. He'll continue to do what he said he's going to do. And we're getting ready for the new year. We got, we got a couple of, maybe one more month left, right? Days, or days, but I, but I believe God has already given it to me, and, and I'm going to share with you that uh, year 2024 is a year of breakthrough. And, and I believe that, and you got to believe that. If things are going to change, and we're going to have to break through, and it's, and it's going to be through God, Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, with no further ado, let's open up our Bibles. And I want to thank those that uh, participated in the outreach. Lives are blessed. There's people in need out there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It doesn't have to just be on an outreach. It could be at the grocery store. It could be wherever you're at to share the love of Jesus. You'd be surprised. We live in a hurting world, and you know that. But there's some people that are... There's people waiting that just said, you know what, if I was invited, I'll come. Next time somebody just invites me, I'll come to church. I said those words one day. And believe it or not, no one ever invited me to church. I don't know if they say that, 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 that guy's not going to change. But how many know that God will find us, amen? It's God who, who draws us. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. And matter of fact, our word of God says that I didn't choose God. That he chose me to bear fruit. And the fruit that should last. He ordained me and you. I love that. You hear me quote that and the latter part of that is when you do that, he says, you can ask the Father in my name. It's Jesus. And whatever you ask the Father in him, he'll give it. That's the word of God. Well, again, no further ado, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Acts. To the book of Acts, chapter 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I believe, I believe breakthrough is coming. Days early. God is ready to do a new thing. But are you ready? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got to be tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen. The same old, same old. You know what insanity is? Doing the same thing and expecting different results ain't going to happen. Acts chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, 
Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Verse 15 says, And in those days Peter stood in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the numbers was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language al that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that continues, God, to manifest itself in this place in our lives. Continue to guide us and direct us, Lord, as, as we seek your face. As we lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you. Your word says that you will direct our path. Direct our path, Lord. Break down the walls, gods, of separation, Lord. Bring us to the brink, Lord, of, of repentance, God, to your word to your will. Help us, Lord, to fulfill the calling, Lord, that you have given us, Lord, the high calling. For that we thank you, Lord. Speak, Lord, to the body, to the people, to your children, to the chosen. We're going to thank you, Lord, in advance for everything you're going to do, Lord, today and forevermore. And all the saints of God say, Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you, Lord. Feels like I haven't been up here in a while. I'm ready to preach. Praise the Lord. God is good. But as I was putting together the message, and almost uh, pastoring now 10 years, next year will be 10 years, I have reached a place in ministry where, where I don't look just to preach to make people shout. But it's a deeper understanding and my goal is to make sure that you understand the word of God and that you live it out. And I'm going to ask you that as you indulge with me and as we today we wrestle with the word of God. In Acts 1, it gives us a record of that moment after Jesus descends into heaven and all the disciples have gathered together. The Bible says they gathered together in the upper room. Then Peter gets up and the Bible says that he begins to speak. And all that our text says today, I just want to remind you that in Acts chapter 1, verse 17, Peter is speaking, and he's speaking about Judas, and this is what he said. He said, he used to be one of our number. And he shared in our ministry, and that was enough. And that's what he said, and he continued on speaking to the people. He said he used to be with us and he, and he used to share in our ministry. And I want to make sure you hear the past tense on that. He used to be because he's not anymore. This is what Peter said. Because if you're a Bible reader and because you're a part of Praise Chapel, Revival, and Oxnard, you should know that the author of Acts is the same author as the author of the book of Luke. Acts picks up where the Gospels end. And after the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will see that after the death of Jesus, Jesus makes what the Bible calls 12 post 
resurrection appearances from the day he rises until the day in Acts chapter 1 in our text. That we call the day of ascension. With the promise of that one day he will return. And I believe that day will be soon as it's drawing closer to us daily. Jesus ascends into heaven, but he gives them instructions. And that the Bible says that the Jesus, that the followers of Jesus, they returned to the upper room. It says there was about 120, not about, there was 100, excuse me, and 120 of them, the Bible records. The same writer of the Gospel of Luke takes time to note the names of the 11 who are in the room. Now, if you're a Bible reader, you know that the, or that's one short of the original number, 12. And it doesn't take a Bible scholar to know that Judas is not in that room. Judas is dead. When you read the gospel accounts, Mark, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find out that they don't always agree on the details around the Gospels and Jesus Christ. And when you're new and you're studying the Bible and you're reading, and you will see the differences on there, but the reality is all the Gospels are different writers and they're telling you from a different perspective. And rather than arguing who's right or wrong, the mature Christian... He understands that all of them give you a broader perspective of what's going on in the Word of God. A a bigger portrait, should I say. Because let me tell you, when you go or when we get to the book of Acts, and these followers get to what they call the upper room, the order of business is to deal with the demise of Judas. What happened to Judas after the betray or the betrayal of Jesus? There are two different accounts according to the demise of the death of Judas. Many of you are familiar with Matthew because Matthew says that after Judas betrayed Jesus, he was filled with remorse knowing that he had what he had done. He went back to the Jewish leaders and he gave them back the 30 pieces of silver and the Bible says that they refused to take that so he was filled with guilt that he hung himself that was according to the book of Matthew but that's not how Luke describes it Luke describes it and he says that after Judas betrays Jesus Luke says right here in verse 18 of our text that he that took the money and he went and he bought a field. He purchased some land and sometimes after that he accidentally fell off a cliff. His intestines spell out and everyone in Jerusalem knew about it. And they called the field al Kadama, which literally means field of blood. Now Matthew says Judas hung himself on the Thursday before they betrayed Jesus. Luke says he went out and he bought a field. And he fell to his death. The reason why I need you to understand that is because it implies that Jesus is still alive. I mean, excuse me, that Judas is still alive when Jesus raises from the dead. Judas took the money to buy a piece of land. You remember when Jesus dies, the woman or the women who followed him to anoint the body, they couldn't do it because it was the Sabbath. And it was Passover. So they had to wait from Friday to Monday. you got to understand that. Because Jewish laws did not allow them to anoint the body of Jesus. And the same law that prohibited them from anointing the body of Jesus also prohibited the transaction 
of the sale of the field. Are you with me? I hope you're with me. And according to Levitical law, when that land was purchased, they had what was called a kinsman redeemer. That required about seven to ten days for the transaction to be valid. So Judas, if Luke is correct and Judas buys the land, he can't begin the transaction until the Sunday which Jesus resurrects. Then it takes some seven to ten days to close on the property. That's according to Levitical law. For at least another week. So we come back to the upper room in Acts 1. When we get to the upper room in Acts 1, Peter steps up and he begins to speak. That's where we are in the text. Peter's not only in the upper room, Peter's in charge. Peter is the pastor of the upper room in the church of Christ, if you want to have it that way. Peter is no doubt in charge. Some of you don't remember Peter, but let me remind you what Peter did. That on the same night Judas betrayed Jesus, Peter denied him. Not once, not twice, but three times. Listen, you can't sweep that under the rug. That's a major offense because you remember in Luke 9, also recorded in Mark 8, Jesus said this, if you act like you don't know me on earth, I'm going to act like I don't know you in heaven. And Peter's denial puts his salvation in jeopardy. Because Jesus, because denying Jesus down here makes Jesus deny him up there. And Peter has denied that. He knows Jesus. We all know that. Now back in the upper room, we now know that Peter's in charge. But at some moment, there had to be some forgiveness going on. Bible doesn't say when and where. But they had allowed him to be in charge in the upper room. Now I got to ask the question. Why would they forgive Peter? Maybe they understood what I'm going to share with you. And this is going to be a difficult, for some, a difficult word for some here at Praise Chapel. Forgiveness is mandatory. I know they've done you wrong. I know they hurt your heart. I know if you had a chance you would slap them. But forgiveness is mandatory. Maybe they were just gathered together in the meeting and they remember what Jesus said to them. If your brother or your sister repents, then you got to forgive them. Maybe when they gave Peter a chance to speak, he reminded them what happened in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus said 70 times 7. Or maybe they got word when Jesus was dying on the cross and he looked at sinful humanity and he said, Father, forgive them. 
Because forgiveness is mandatory. Or maybe they said, I, I, I got a long list of stuff that I have to be forgiven from. And I'm not going to go to hell because I can't forgive them. Isn't it strange how we can make some people sin worse than ours? Isn't it amazing how we can make our sins so little and their sins so big? That's amazing. So maybe they forgave Peter because it was mandatory. Or maybe because they really believed in the power of the blood of Jesus. Wonder-working power. They forgave him because it was mandatory. They forgave him because they needed to be forgiven. I'm going to pause because some of you are thinking that I'm talking about Peter, but I'm talking about you. And here's where it gets tough. For the same reasons they forgave Peter, they had to be willing to forgive Judas. What? You might not like this, but forgiveness is available to Judas. I know it's tough because we demonize Judas, right? If anybody went straight to hell, it was Judas, right? Judas is such a villain, vilified name that we won't even name our dog Judas. But what I might suggest to you, because forgiveness is necessary and because you don't forgive him Jesus won't forgive you and because there's power in the blood of Jesus that Jesus or Judas, Judas had to be forgiven also pastor where are you going with all Stay with me. And remember, Judas is still alive. After the death and resurrection, Judas is alive for at least almost 10 days. And when you get back to the upper room, Peter has already been restored. But Judas hasn't. Peter is back with him, but Judas ain't. I don't think it could get much quieter than this. At some point, they were willing to restore Peter and release Judas. Nobody ever went back to look for Judas and bring him back. At least I couldn't find it. Nobody ever went back and said, let's get Judas and bring him back to the upper room, yet Peter is there. Even though they knew he was still alive. Because when they got to the upper room, 
the issue was not forgiveness. The issue was reconciliation. Forgiveness is m mandatory. But reconciliation is optional. You can decide to forgive someone and still decide to separate from them. Hear me. I can let it go and let them go. There's nothing unchristian about forgiving and releasing at the same time. The reality is every relationship you have, if it be romantic, business, family, offense is going to happen. That's inevitable. But you will have to forgive. But the deeper decision that you have to discern is am I dealing with a Peter or am I dealing with a Judas? That's the discernment that you have to have. Why do you suppose they forgave and brought back Peter and not Judas? Maybe because they knew that when Peter denied Judas, it was because of fear. And when Judas betrayed Jesus, it was because of greed. Because I don't know if you know, but back in those days, you had to own land or a piece of property to be in the status or the social status quo. You couldn't just drive around in a big Benz because they didn't have those. You couldn't just look at it and say, well, look at the Gucci, because they didn't wear those. But they had to buy property, and that put them to a status quo. Because that was what Judas was looking for, was the status quo. He was benefiting on the pain that he caused Jesus. So the big discernment is you got to know whether it's a Peter or it's a Judas. Should I go deeper? Because if someone is willing to benefit on your pain, that's a Judas. And that's exactly why Judas, although he was forgiven by the people, was not brought back into the fold with the people of God. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Very short, very to the point, but I believe through the Holy Spirit has done its work.
I believe today is a day when you, someone asks you, what did the pastor preach about? You're not going to say it was just good. I believe you're going to elaborate a little bit and recognize and give some spiritual discernment into your life. Because it is critical who you surround yourself with. Very critical. Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. Surround yourself with men and women of God that are going to direct you. They may not have all the answers. Especially when you know God has called you. That there's a plan and a purpose. There's a reason why things that you're doing are not working. God has something much greater for our lives. But we must have spiritual discernment in our lives. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy of our praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's men and women in this place as we come closer to the end of the year that are undecided with the decisions in their life. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Also in the book of James it says, if we ask for wisdom, God will give it. A portion of that is true. But if you go even deeper, it says if you're unwise, the reason why we don't get wisdom is because we think we know it already. It's humility that Jesus exalts. He says, the proud he will despise. If you look at that man or that woman who was proud, a fall is coming. That's the word of God. You're here today, and I might have the microphone, but it's the inner man, the Spirit of God that lives within you, that speaks. The Bible says that His people, his, they hear His voice, the sheep. And the sheep are looking for direction. You're looking for direction in your life. But maybe in the wrong places. If God ain't in it, it ain't going to work. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You heard me say it before. I said, no, I got you. I got you, Jesus. I can still do it. You know what he said? It will amount to nothing. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. You're here today and 
Holy Spirit is speaking into your life and say, Pastor, you know what? I need that. I need that direction, that guidance. Bible says that the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can now live in you. You're here today and you say, you know what? I, I need direction from the Lord. I need, I need guidance. I need the Holy Spirit to reside in me. I'm going to ask that you do one more thing, that you lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. I want to pray. I see you. I see you. I see you back. I see you. I see you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God is so good. Many of you have said that. Many of you have, have meant that. But maybe there's things that have come into your life that have knocked you off course. It's time to come back. Come back to the Father. Story of the prodigal son that the father was, was waiting. He saw the son afar and he came running to him. That's the picture of the, of the father in our lives. As when we come back, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. That's a promise. You're here today and you're willing to recommit your life to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're not ashamed of the gospel because it's a power of God unto salvation. I'm going to ask that you make a bold statement and you come and you declare I want to recommit my vows to Jesus. Come. Come. Those who raise their hand for salvation also come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come, come. Come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And whatever else is holding you in that seat, you got to let it go. You got to let it go and you got to lay it at the feet of Jesus. I don't know what it is, but you know. You got to lay it at the feet of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And if you're right standing, please raise your hands. In prayer to these saints. Those who are here to say the sinner's prayer, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died on that cross. But three days later, you rose again from the dead. And you live forevermore. Come into my life. I repent. Forgive me from all my sins. Wash me. From the precious blood of Jesus, I lay down my life. I give you my life. I surrender. I thank you, Lord. Your word said, if any man or woman be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new comes in. You're a new creation. You said that prayer, you meant it. Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll never be the same. Thank you, Jesus. You said that prayer. You continue in your word. A relationship with God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand. For those souls. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to stay over here. I want to pray. For all those also that have recommitted their lives or laid down things that are keeping you from being all that you can be in Christ. I want to pray with you. I want to take the time. You lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Prepare the hearts, Lord, of your people, God. 
I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done, what you're doing, Lord. Let your anointing, God, that breaks the yoke of bondage, that sets a captive free. I thank you, Lord. Have your way, Lord. This man of God, Lord, that seeks you, God, that knows, Lord, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I thank you for him, my Father. From the top of his head to the soles of his feet, touch him right there, Lord, right there. Right where is that? That's the Lord. That's the Lord. Use his life, God. Use his life as a mouthpiece, as an instrument, as a vessel for your honor and for your glory. I thank you, Lord. There it is right there. It's Jesus. That's Jesus. Let it go. Let it go. There it is right there. That's the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. For this woman of God, Lord, that every tear she releases, God, you, 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 you save it. That's how much you care. I thank you, Father, and I pray, Lord, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, a cleansing, God, a spiritual awakening, God, that would take place in her life. As she draws near to you, God, you will draw near to us. Have your way, her. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lay it down at his feet. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God is so good. 